All right, so we're going to start on time. Uh, thank you all for joining us in person and online today. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ann Steiger from Texas A&M Kingsville. So uh, Dr. Steiger uh, got her undergraduate and master's degrees from Oklahoma State. She then went north, so she is used to the cold. Uh, she was at Cornell University for her PhD, uh, as well as some time as a postdoc. Uh, she did do a little bit of a post or a, a shorter stint of a postdoc in Sweden mm. uh, before then she was at Auburn and now she's finally at Texas A&M Kingsville uh, and she'll talk a little bit about her research program there uh, today for us. So thank you for, for being here and enduring the cold. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to kind of summarize but talk more about the research that I did from my program. So why I am qualified to talk about precision phenotyping. Um, so I did my undergrad at Oklahoma State University. I did an honors thesis looking at adipogenesis in beef cattle. So that was first step of learning how to separate muscle from fat. Do not recommend. <laughs> uh, I decided to stay for a master's looking at milk production in sheep, but I also got to help out on some projects in cattle looking at muscle development, and also looking at sheep, looking at the calipige pathway, gene pathway, and how that impacted muscle development. Um, but I decided sheep were not fun. So, <laughs> no offense. <laughs> and <laughs> then I went to Cornell University, and at Cornell University, that's probably where I really got into precision phenotyping, or what I would call baby precision phenotyping where I got to work in equine genetics, looking at locomotion, conformation, and behavior in horses. So trying to come up with what are good ways to define those traits. Uh, so we were doing body measurements by hand. I measured over 8,800 horses. I now have a like twinge in my shoulder from doing all those body measurements. So from that experience, that kind of led to, how can I do this without killing myself? <laughs> Right? I also got sat on by horses while I was taking those body measurements. So what's a better way to do this a little bit safer? And then from there, I realized there aren't a lot of jobs for equine geneticists. It's a very small community, very small job opportunities. So that's where I looked at postdocs in other species. Because one of the beauties of genetics is once you learn in one species, you can apply it somewhere else. But sometimes people have a hard time seeing that or remembering that with genetics. So showing that experience in other species is really important. So I did a short postdoc at Cornell um, looking at Criollo cattle from South America and trying to do some population structure with them and body size measurements in African goats. Then I went to Sweden and I went back to horses. But this was a really good lab to be in because it let me develop some evolutionary genetics techniques. So trying to trace how or date how old a genetic mutation was in horses related to gait. And I got to do some other projects with that as well. And then I came back to Cornell where I got to work with genetics of Alaskan sled dogs, some chickens, dairy cows, goats, and then ironically back to sheep, <laughs> looking at coat color. But that gave me lots of experience looking at different phenotypes, different traits, different species at the same time. So I know grad students are in here. So one of the things that you should take advantage while you're in grad school is trying to maximize the opportunities that are out there. Build your toolkit because it makes you more marketable later, no matter where you go. Okay. So from there, I went to Auburn for two years and developed some of the projects that we're going to talk about today. But that was just two years. It was a visiting assistant professor. So non-tenure track and then a tenure track position opened at Texas A&M Kingsville. So I got there. Okay. So my interest based off of a little bit of what I've done through my degrees, but what I have now is really using genetics and biotechnology and combining them together to look at ways that we can improve health production and behavior in animal livestock animals specifically but trying to do it in a more sustainable way. So at the end of the day, our goal is to help producers make money or at least not lose money in their production. So my major focus is on confirmation and locomotion. I've gotten pulled into a project looking at IgG 
passive transfer, and then dabbling in reproduction and behavior some more. So, what is sustainable production or agriculture? How would you define that? Minimize waste. What else? Minimize expenses. Something that can like sustain over the long period. Right? Yeah. So ways we can minimize waste, reduce loss, maintain profit, right? If we talk about farmers and producers, they're trying to maintain their profit or at least break even. But then also we want to think about environmental impact as well. And so some of the ways that we can think about that is an example is using our beef cattle and thinking about what's sustainable production in beef cattle. So if we look at the number of cows or the amount of beef product that we produce starting in the 1960s to today, right? The amount of beef that we produced in the 1960s was around 250 pounds. Today we're now at 660 pounds or higher that we're being able to produce from our cattle. But when we look at the total number of cattle that are being produced, over time we started here, but now we've had about a 35% decline in cattle number. Would that be sustainable ag? Right, we're producing more with less. So trying to do a great job with that, right? From there, what we can look at now, because there's a big push for climate change, right? Looking at greenhouse gas emissions and the impact that it's having on the environment. So as agriculturists, we need to be good stewards of our land and our production. So one of the things that we've seen by reducing the number of cattle, but still improving production, is we've actually seen a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from cattle, about 16.3% comparing 1970 to about 2007. So that's kind of exciting, right? But when we look at overall production and the greenhouse gas emissions, agriculture is still the major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So this graph is just showing you kind of a breakdown of the different sectors within agriculture. And what you will notice is it's not necessarily livestock that are the major contributor, but we still have to feed livestock. So crop production still feeds into that impact as well. Okay. But when we look at the cows, specifically for beef cattle, the major contributor to those greenhouse gas emissions is coming from enteric production. So 93%. So what does that mean? Enteric production. Rumination, right? So what we're feeding them, how they're digesting or processing that feed. 93% of their greenhouse gas emissions is coming from there. 7% is coming from manure, so fermentation of the manure. So that's why beef cattle actually have a greater impact than dairy cattle, even though dairy cattle is doing a lot to mitigate the effects of their manure lagoons and actually turning that into biofuel. So that's kind of cool. So what are the ways that we can reduce these greenhouse gas emissions in cattle? So one, we can feed them alternative feeds. So there was a study done in Australia looking at feeding red microalgae, and they had a 95% reduction in that enteric greenhouse gas emissions, which is super cool. Another therapy or another technology we can apply is genetic selection. And we can apply that because we know greenhouse gas emissions, specifically methane production, has a moderate heritability. So there's genetic control for how much that methane is being produced. So if we think about agriculture of these two, which one do we think is beneficial? Or like pros and cons. Let's do that, actually, that's a better way to do it. Pros and cons of these two technologies. So pros of using nutrition. What would that do? Is it? Yeah, you're substituting. I have to buy it, depends, right? So algae, this is actually coming from seaweed. 
So we'd have to harvest it from the ocean. I think there's an algae. Right. So these are setting up research opportunities, right? Is it only this algae or can I look at other algae, right? So research opportunities, opening that up. Effect is quicker. What's the con of using nutrition? Change the taste. Can change the taste, so palatability of the feed that we're feeding them. Can impact growth. Also, I'm not allowed to use any states to use algae. Really? I'll see. I didn't know that. Because I got reached out from someone at the university that wanted to do a feeding trial with it. So hmm. <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> that's really good to know. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> What's another con of using just pure nutrition? Bingo, right? As soon as I remove that feed additive, they go right back to their natural production that they had. So if I look at genetic selection then, so what are the pros of genetic selection? Or actually maybe I'll do the other way. What's the cons of genetic selection? Takes multiple generations. Takes multiple generations. Takes time, money, phenotyping. What are the pros? Permanent, right? So I, one, need to, one, make sure that I actually have variation in that production. And I've already set this up, right? Other studies have shown, at least in Angus, primarily beef cattle breeds, that there is variation in methane production, and it is due to variation in their genetics. So once you've been able to identify those individuals that have the low methane production, I can select for those animals, and they'll be the parents, and now permanent reduced greenhouse gas emissions in my cattle breeds. So that's the advantage of genetic selection, which may have just done my genetic selection. So if we think about this slide, why use genetic selection or what's driving the genetic selection, what do you guys know about genetic selection that I didn't tell you? I just walked in the door and have no idea. Who can answer that question? Environment. Mm -hmm. Environment impacts it. How do we make our genetic selection? Breeding. So, how do we decide who is the one we're going to breed and who we're not going to breed? Right? What do we call that term? Phenotyping. Yes, right? Phenotyping, right? This is that beautiful basic equation from genetics, right? P equals G plus E. Your phenotype equals your genetics plus your environment. So if we eliminate the environmental impact and can just consider all of our animals are in the same environment, we can look at their genetics. We need to base it off of the phenotype. But that means with our greenhouse gas emissions, we can use both, right? We can use genetic selection initially and then start to add other environmental impacts to try to bring down that greenhouse gas emission. Hooray! <laughs> you guys remember things. That's always good. Okay. So when we talk about phenotyping, the success of our genetic selection is based off of how well we did at phenotyping our animals. So going back to like measuring horses, I was using a measuring tape that may slide. So did I actually have a true accurate measurement of what that animal is? Or if they have a really fluffy coat, like with the sheep, right? Are they sheared or are they not sheared when I take that body measurement? That can impact the precision of my phenotyping. So a lot of what we're seeing today is applying new technologies and artificial intelligence into helping us with that phenotyping process. So, for example, Sealock is building these feed intake machines. So, measuring feed intake, how much is that animal eating? And then you can weigh the animal and get what? Feed efficiency. Yeah, feed efficiency, average daily gain. 
So which would we rather have, an animal that's feed efficient or not feed efficient? Feed efficient, right? So when we look at greenhouse gas emissions, there is a positive correlation with the amount of food that they eat. So one of the ways that we can look at is an animal that's feed efficient should also have lower greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a cool thing that we can look at. And we can do that too with the sea log looking at their green feed units. So this is measuring greenhouse gas emissions based off of while the cows there eating a little treat while they're there. So you can get all of that information, precise measurements, and also using those fancy ear tags that have RFIDs. So you have precise measurements, how much they ate, how much they weigh, how much greenhouse gas emissions they produce. We can also use collars to measure like how much are they moving, right? Because that can also impact their weight. So thinking about all the things or the impacts that can have on our phenotype, and having the technology to measure that. We can also use drones. Why would we use drones? Yep, I love that answer. Yep, they are fun. Rats. <laughs> Hopefully you don't, because they're kind of expensive, right? <laughs> Yeah, so it's one way you can track your animals. Um, they're now attaching different types of cameras to the drones where you can look at heat maps, right? So you could actually go out, survey your animals, and you can look at body temperature. So do you have a sick animal or a healthy animal? Um, one of the things that we're kind of interested in doing is can we detect lameness? So acute lameness, right? Do they have early heat onset and can you see that using a drone without getting too close <laughs> to the animal. So you can use it for that. They've also been using it just even general for ranch management, right? Like herd your animals. Do I actually need an animal? Although that has some success. If you've ever watched Clarkson's Farms on Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's good times. So then we're also looking at other technology to quantify confirmation. So this is showing different types of cameras again and the kind of scanning that you can do to look at confirmation and body condition score. So you can use anywhere from 2D to 3D images to try to better map out the confirmation. So rather than taking 50 body measurements, I can take a camera, scan it, and get that as a continuous variable, right? And then use a artificial intelligence to give me output from those measurements. So these are fun, fun things that I wish had been around when I was doing my PhD. Things might be a lot better for me. So once you have those precise phenotypes, then we can apply genetic selection or go even further into the molecular genetics and genotype your animals based off of do you have that phenotype, do you not have that phenotype, run different types of analysis and identify the different genetic areas in the genome that are associated with your phenotype. And hopefully they'll be significant, so you can say, yes, this is a causative mutation or not a causative mutation, or these are the markers that I should use for genetic selection. So we're gonna step back and talk about some of the programs that I'm interested in. So why I like animal locomotion so much is if an animal can't move, can you do anything else with that animal? All right, if an animal can't move, they can't eat. If an animal can't move, can you use them in reproduction? All right, so locomotion impacts everything. So being able to quantify, are they lame, are they not lame? And then I also come from the horse background, so the quality of the movement is also super important. So we also use lameness scores, thinking about the dairy industry and even beef cattle industry, right? If an animal hurts while they're moving, they're less likely to go to their food source. So they're gonna lose body condition score. So there's an impact for using that locomotion. 
We do know that locomotion is controlled by genetics and the neurobiology. So central pattern generators, these are a set of neural circuits in the body that controls locomotion. So how you walk, how you blink your eyes, when you breathe, these are a set of locomotor neurons that are firing. So for example, if we start with A, this is a neuron that fires, it'll block B, B, because B's off, C can fire, C can fire, A gets blocked, so now B walks. And you go through this process of these are the impulses from your neurons, okay? So this, again, dictates locomotion, respiration, blinking your eyes, swallowing. These are all the fun neurons. And we've been able to study this by looking at mice, cats, and different leech, different models. But we do know genetics is in control because looking at, oh, I forgot how many I have in there is looking at mouse models. So they've done gene knockouts in some of the genes that control these neurons, and they were able to impact the type of locomotion. So in these cats, they knocked out this mutation that impacts whether it crosses the spinal cord or not across the spinal cord. So a normal mouse walks slash trots like what you see a dog or a cow do. When they knocked out this gene, they started hopping like a bunny. So it's like, cool, we know genes can impact locomotion. And we can use that even further in our larger species. So horses are known for variation in the way that they move, specifically at these intermediate speeds. So most horses, we talk about the trot. We can look at other breeds and they do other gates, such as the pace, running walk, foxtrot, rack, tolt, if you're from any of these other different breeds. And they looked at them specifically at the Icelandic horse and compared horses that could do a pace. So this horse is doing a pace, legs are traveling together on the same side of the body, and compared them to horses that couldn't do this pace. And they identified this gene DMRT3. From that, they then looked at that mutation, found a mutation, the stop codon in the DNA that shortened the protein. So that inhibited their ability of pace, not pace. That's what they initially thought. Then they started looking at other horse breeds, specifically looking at the standard bred. So racing standard breds, they can pace or trot at faster speeds. Both the trotters and the pacers had this genetic mutation. So really, when we look at all the other gated breeds, what you notice is whatever that gate that they can do, they can do it at faster speeds. So they don't necessarily break into what we call the canter. And that's the same thing that we see in the standard breads and these Icelandic horses that do the flying pace. They're doing whatever that intermediate gate was at a faster speed. So this mutation gatekeeper, whatever gate you do, you're keeping it at a faster speed. So we know genetics controls locomotion. We know there's variation in it. So we can keep looking for phenotyping, doing more precise phenotyping. Because the other thing they did with this was a survey of the owners. Does your horse do a flying pace? Does your horse not do a flying pace? That's how they did this. <laughs> precise phenotyping. No. So, one of the things that we're working on, and this is in collaboration with the University of Florida, this is a project I started at Auburn University, now brought down to Texas, is looking at can we use other more precise ways to measure that locomotion? And we started in horses because horses are easier to video. <laughs> and I will show you why they're easier to video at least a comparison, because we're also trying this in cattle. So we started with 2D video, and we're just measuring the horses as they walk, trot, and canter, right? And then we've also started applying 3D video images. So this is 3D in multiple senses. We have a camera that can measure depth, so we're getting confirmation, but then we have four cameras set up, so we're actually getting a full 3D view of how the horse moves. 
So this is a project that one of my master's students started at Auburn University. We're still trying to get data out of our collaborator to make it work. But we did a trial run with some of the cattle at Auburn University. And this is where we need a little uh, finesse in how we set up our cameras. But this is showing you. So we have a camera here, camera here. There's another one down here and another one here. So what we're still working on is how to get the cows to pass through the cameras where we only get one cow at a time. We were slightly successful. Um, we did get a few cows that can walk through individually, but that's kind of our interest is one starting with the horses. We also did a measurement where we were taking video every two weeks for six months. So the question that we were trying to answer is, well, what's stable? And what is not, which are the biomechanics that identify lameness and can we detect it early enough? Cause we were using the Auburn NCAA 18 horses. Mm -hmm. They get ridden every day and they go lame. <laughs> so we definitely had horses that at a certain point we could stop taking the video because they were lame. We couldn't actually take the video from them, but we had video prior to that where now we could go back and look for when did we start to see changes in their biomechanics? So from there, we wanna apply the same thing, looking at cattle, sheep, and goats of, can we detect lameness? Can we use this 3D system to look at that measurement? Because right now, what we're doing is we're just running them through. The gold standard for lameness detection, at least in horses, is using accelerometers attached to the horse at various body points which that limits our ability to be able to put accelerometers on the animals, right? If you have a young horse, are they used to having things on them? No, and it takes a little bit of training. So one of the other questions we're interested in looking at is how do the biomechanics change as they get older? And can we predict from their confirmation what their locomotion will be? So we do wanna do a comparison of comparing accelerometers attached to the horse and how that compares to our markerless system. And we're hoping we can develop that with the horses because then we can use the markerless system in cattle. So I don't know about you, but I don't wanna put accelerometers on a cow's leg or back because I'm pretty sure they're gonna kick it off. But, so that's an advantage of using the markerless system. And I realize I'm talking really fast, but we'll see how this goes. Any questions so far? I have a suggestion for you to measure on cows. Oh, good. You just put the cameras like in the alley that they go to drink water. Oh. So they're going to do like multiple times in the day. Yeah. To go the way they walk. I like that. One of the ideas we'd been thinking about, um, which it's my last slide that we talk about this, we're going to try to measure the feed intake and greenhouse gas emissions in the cattle, but we have to weigh them. So one of the thoughts we had is as they're coming out of the chute from the scale, we could have the camera set up there. So that way we're getting one cow at a time and not getting um, occlusions from having another animal there. But I, I like that also. For, water natural. Yeah, water, yeah. And I could get it every day. Ooh, that's a good idea. Thank you. So by being able to have this 3D, both confirmation and locomotion analysis, starting with a live animal, what we're hoping is we can make predictions about carcass quality from that evaluation. We can also start to look at confirmation and structure. So do a better job of rather than using a subjective scoring for foot and claw and leg disorders, we now have an objective measure of that confirmation. Right? And we can apply this to our other livestock species to identify those animals with structural correctness or not correct. And the end goal <laughs> is to develop an app so that at the end of the day, if we can take the 3D information, use our AI systems to better quantify what's happening, we could transfer that back to building an application where a farmer can just go out and take a picture or take a video of their animal and they'll have either these scores already done for them or they'll get that information that can then be used in their genetic evaluations.
That's our hope. We'll see if it works. So one of the other projects that I got pulled into that it ties back, I promise, is looking at immunoglobulin G, so passive transfer. So what do you guys know about animals when they're first born? Do they have a functioning immune system? So how do they get their antibodies? Colostrum, right? So in horses, we were reached out to by an owner. They had a mare that they've been giving her vaccines, so she should be building the antibodies that should go into the colostrum. But she had a foal that they had to supplement with IgG. And they went back and looked at her records. She's had now four foals, actually. All of them had to be supplemented with IgG. And they have other mares on the property, same management program, haven't had to be supplemented in the same year. So we know it's not management, it's the mayor. And fun thing, they have a full sister to this mayor. She's now had two foals, same vaccine program. Both foals had to be supplemented with IgG. So we gave, the, we asked for more records from the farm and we actually found more mares that were related, similar issues, and they actually have three generations of mares that they've kept in their program. So they had mare that they had when the foal was born, low IgG had to be supplemented. They kept that mare in the breeding program. She's now having foals of her own. They have to be supplemented. They also have mares, high IgG when it was born. Every foal they've had, high IgG hasn't been had to be supplemented. So we're thinking, ooh, Congenital, <laughs> this is something related to genetics. So fortunately, they went to a commercial foaling facility, so they have IgG records for all their horses. We reached out to that farm and said, hey, can we see if there's any other horses that are coming to your facility that have a similar issue? So that facility was really nice. We need to go back and get more records but they gave us access to four years worth of records. From that, we were able to pull records from 218 foals, 136 mares, 50 of those mares had repeated foalings at this facility. And what we identified was an unusually high percentage of foals with low IgG. So when they first tested them, this was 700 milligrams of IgG in the bloodstream, so they had to be supplemented later. They had about 26% that were normal, 11% that were high, and then 8% they didn't pull an IgG record, so these were older records from our case study farm that they weren't measuring IgG, but we had the polls information. When we went back and looked at the mares, we found about Mayors that had only had one foal, we have those records, but then the recurrent ones, about, I'll make sure I get you the right number, 13% of those mares had recurrent low foals, so had to be supplemented. So it's not just our case study herd, it's more. And then we also had several that were recurrent, high, or normal. And then the 17% of those were variable. So some years they were low, some years they were high. So more than likely those are management that we don't want to include in our study. But this is just showing you the pedigree of some of our horses. So the red ones are the recurrent lows, the yellow ones are recurrent highs. And we do see this familial relationship. So is suggesting genetics. Okay. So we have a plan. I had a master's student all lined up for this and then she backed out on me. I was super sad but we have a plan for this project that we wanted to look at of collecting. Is it the foal, is it the mare? We're pretty sure it's the mare, <laughs> but we need to figure out what is going on with the records. So we wanted to pull blood, plasma, colostrum samples, and milk samples, and just see what's going on with our different animals. But one of the questions that came up for me that a lot of people talked about, at least the management told me, is some of these mares they start leaking colostrum before the foal is born. 
So that led to a question of, well, is it mastitis in the mare or is it teat shape, right? Is there something different about her teat shape that means she's leaking the colostrum? Because when we look at cattle, especially dairy cattle, there is a difference in teat shape and their incidence for mastitis. So do we have something similar in horses? So this is where we can use our beautiful 3D confirmation to classify teat shape in horses. So this is a fun side project. Hopefully we can pull this off. So this also ties back to the blood and the plasma that we're pulling, that we plan on pulling, is we also want to look at biomarkers. Can we find a biomarker that's associated in the mare related to her reproduction ability? But this is a project we started at uh, Auburn. So Paul Dice, Dr. Paul Dice, has been using biomarkers to look at reproductive performance in heifers. So can I use biomarkers to say this heifer is going to be staying in the herd or is this heifer not going to be? And he's actually had some pretty good success. These are crossbred animals. So they're Angus, Semmental, and Herford. So one of the projects that we're doing, we did some whole genome sequencing with our crossbred heifers, some that had good and bad differences in their biomarker levels. So now we wanna go back and see, can we find genetics controlling that? And can we do some ancestry modeling and figure out which breed in that crossbreed is contributing to that difference in fertility? Okay. So my last thing, I guess I'll be a little short. It's fine, it'll be good. Um, we did just get a grant from the USDA, the NRCS, and this is to measure feed intake and greenhouse gas emissions in cattle. So we are interested in looking at specifically our beautiful Brahmin and tropically adapted cattle and looking at feed intake, greenhouse gas emissions and developing a genetic selection panel for tropically adapted cattle because I'm in South Texas. It was 70 degrees when I left. I think it's like 85 right now. <laughs> so we're a lot warmer. So having this Brahmin influence is really important for our cattle in South Texas. <laughs> yes. So we're, we're initially going to be measuring that greenhouse gas emissions, the feed intake, but then also taking video using our 3D video and confirmation to look at how does feed intake impact the confirmation or at least the body condition score of those cattle. And then we're setting up two pens, one in the traditional way Seedlock tells us to do, and then in a non-traditional way because these are Brahmin cows and Brahmin bulls. <laughs> so how does the layout of our facility impact the behavior of those animals? But that's our what we got going on. Um, so I have to have my lovely acknowledgements page, which I meant to put Chris on here of like thanking me. Thank you for letting me come and talk to you guys and get feedback on some of the things that we're doing. That is what I got 40 minutes. So I made 40 minutes, not 45. <laughs> so any questions or feedback that you're like, that's a terrible idea. There is a lot of studies that have looked at like biomarkers for feed intake and feed efficiency in mostly in sheep, but also in goats and cattle with these small compounds called vaginic amines. Okay. I don't know where else to that, but like, <laughs> I guess have you uh, heard or looked at anything like that? I haven't looked at that. Um... That might be something that we could try to look at with the cows. The issue will be all of them will be on the same type of feed, so there won't be any variation in the feed. But we could see if there are a lot of them are microbially produced only. Mm. So that could um, I don't know, be a predictor. Yeah. That's a good idea. No, I like that. My non nutrition background is coming into play here. Yeah. Um, 
I was really interested in your biomarkers for reproductive performance. Um, can you speak to what? Can you speak to maybe what biomarkers you're looking at, or? I would have to go back. So Paul has published some papers on that. He's had a few master's students that have put out the publications, and it's been a couple of years since I've sat and like I have the whole genome sequencing data. I just have to like run it. Um, this is what happens when you move from Alabama to Texas, and then. They give you a 75% teaching load, <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm trying to, I would have to go back and look at what he was looking at. So we did pick, we picked 4 heifers. We made sure they were unrelated. So 2 had high for, um, I think he had like 4 or 5 markers that he was running. So the ones that were consistently high in that panel mm -hmm. and consistently low in the other panel. And actually what we did is we did match. A high versus low, they were related, but then unrelated to the other pair and that pair were also related. So we're trying to account for. Was it just sire effect or breed effect, making sure they were the same percentage, but I'd have to go back and look at the biomarkers. But they're published, I know they're published. <laughs> Ooh, I did an awesome job. Or no. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the grant you have for your Indicus catalog work? Yeah. So, say about it. yeah. So, that grant, it was, a, they called it a smart commodities, climate smart. Yeah, climate smarts commodities grant. So, they were specifically looking at developing a marketable product that would help underserved or under minority underrepresented populations that would help them succeed in agriculture. So the project that we pitched, this is in partnership with Soetis, um, Brahmin Country Genetics is providing us the Brahmin cattle. We're also working with Lee Leachman, which I understand he's like moving some operations up here in Montana. So you might see more of me, I don't know, or that's like, ooh, that may be new news. Um, <laughs> so we're working with them. So, WETIS is developing the genetic evaluation panel, but we're providing the phenotyping of the feed and fit, feed intake greenhouse gas emissions with the goal. It's a 3 year project that we'll be able to identify both bulls and heifers. That have this higher feed intake, but lower greenhouse gas emissions that can be marketed. And then we're offering a voucher to producers that purchase those bulls or semen or heifers. Based off of, did you buy it? Are you a young farmer? Are you a minority? <laughs> and then, or if you're a small cattle owner, so you have 200 or less cows. So, based off of that, we'll provide 500 if you only meet one, 750 or 1000 if you meet all three to help supplement the purchase of those animals with the goal that that will infiltrate the cow calf producer network so that we now have lower greenhouse gas emissions. From the beef industry. How much was that for? 4.7 million. Yeah. And we have about $600,000 in those vouchers. So we're hoping we can pull it off. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll be updating our infrastructure. So we have a bull testing center and then a pasture based unit for the methane production. So we can start testing the heifers. We also have money set aside that we can do genetic testing on additional animals that don't go through our testing facility so that we can help improve that EPD for greenhouse gas emissions. That'll be offered through Zoetis. <laughs> well, yeah, the green gas measurement, the thing is that it's just like. 5 minutes off the animal and eating it. And you're yeah, to... but it should be multiple times per day that the animals coming up to the machine. So it's, okay. it's not like. Oh, you keeping them in a chamber and you're measuring everything that they're outputting, but you're getting an average of the day. So, 1 of the things I've been forewarned about the Brahmin is some of them just don't come up at all to it. So it's another reason we want to look at the behavior is like, well, what about that cow? Or bull. Do they not want to come up to the feeder? That's one of our little side projects. Yeah. Yay being an HSI. <laughs> um, yeah, we're excited about that project. It's 4.7 million for three years. The 
questions for Mark Schlager? Okay, great. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.